Right, so hello, my name is Vasilios Kuzmakos. Today is April 29th, 2022. Who do I have the pleasure with of speaking with today? William Kerr. Fantastic. Now, if you can just begin by telling me a little bit about who you are, you know, your work, that type of thing. I'm a fourth generation Florida resident. Mm -hmm. had, had my own business for over 30 years for environmental consulting, doing permitting and mitigation bank work habitat restoration uh, one time i had a lot of employees now i don't have any <laughs> so um i noticed that you were the chair for the um what is it the southwest um water st john's st john's water, water management district tell me a little bit about how you got to that position and kind of your role um in that position well i was requested to apply uh by some phone, some friends of mine here in town, and Jeb Bush finally decided to, not finally, but Jeb Bush did appoint me uh, to St. John's River Water Management District's governing board, and that was in '99, and I became I was elected by that board as chairman, and at the at the time you're chairman for two consecutive years so i was chairman between 2000 and 2021 i mean 2000 and 2001. fantastic now if you can just tell me a little bit about kind of um you know kind of any of the major projects you kind of oversaw you know that type of thing the culture of the board at the time well the water management district is really an agency to restore the environment. It also has a permitting arm. Uh, during my tenure, uh, the upper basin of the St. Johns River had about 200,000 or more acres of, of emergent marsh added to their, uh, to, to the basin. Um, it, it, they, the water management district for years had planned to do a levy uh, limited restoration because the stormwater basin for the for the upper basin of the St. Johns River was really large and agriculture and housing developments had encroached on that basin. So the only way to restore as much as possible was to do uh, a restoration with as little physical works as possible. And that was done by, cul by culverts and, and levees and uh, was initiated under my tenure as chairman, but not completed till much later. Mm. So kind of, so kind of discuss the conduct behind that kind of restoration project a bit more, right? So what exactly was happening? Um, why is that so significant that you did that? Well, it, it is the largest restoration project marsh restoration project in the world. Yeah. Um, and the water management district's responsibility was to purchase the land required for the restoration. And the Corps of Engineers was responsible for doing the design and uh, you know, approval of, of the levee and culvert system to restore the marsh. And uh, um... So you kind of mentioned what you just you just mentioned what you believe the role of water management districts are. I heard someone tell me that the role of water management districts is to enforce water quality law. Um, would you agree with that assessment? What do you think is the purpose of water management districts? The law has been in place for water management districts since 1972, mm -hmm. and the legislature. Uh, from 1972 to date has added more responsibilities to the water management district. Uh, my view of the water management district is they're an environmental restoration group and land management group. Uh, they also have permitting responsibilities uh, for both land use, uh, which would be ERP permits and for consumptive use, which would be water withdrawal permits. Um, so the water management districts are bound by state laws set by the legislature, uh, which requires them to do X, Y, Z based on the existing law. 
So, you know, as we kind of thought of um, when we both attended the Florida Spring Summit, there's a bit of this, of a disparity, it seems like, between what some people view as kind of the reality on the ground, right? You know, the water's getting greener, and some people are, you know, think that the water's getting, you know, worse, right? Water management districts, though, um, and, and sometimes the numbers, right, don't kind of, you know, have the same kind of picture. Why is there such a disparity? Well, that's not something I really know a lot about, but I do know that that nitrogen and phosphorus are the major pollutants, and there are older ways of identifying nitrogen as nitrates, nitrites, etc., and there are newer ways. As science finds a better way to do something, there are newer ways to do it. I am not sure that that all the water quality data is on the same basis. Uh, so I think there's a little confusion there. Um, uh, when I was on the board, I was not aware of any uh, intentional subterfuge for the staff to, to distort things in anybody's favor. Um, and we were there as a board members to try to make sure that the science that was produced by the water management districts was the best around. Um, so as, as what it's going on now, I haven't been on the board since 2008 and that's a long time. So I can't tell you what's going on now. All right, so, excuse me, sorry, one second. Uh, so um you know so i guess we can just circle back to your work with wetland mitigation so you know um you know wetlands obviously serve a incredibly important role you know in um they have a lot of, they provide a lot of ecosystem services but you know i think there's also kind of a you know at least a public maybe misconception of why wetlands are so important right it's like people tend to view wetlands as kind of these kind of big kind of messy kind of scary areas why why do wetlands serve such an why do wetlands serve such an important kind of role um, within our ecosystem? And, um, and what do they do to humans that we should be aware about? It is the most diverse habitat in the state of Florida because the state of Florida is on the same long latitude as the Sahara Desert. So that means we, it's Florida is a droughty state. We get between 48 and 52 inches of rainfall a year. And most of that comes in the summer in thunderstorm events that you know can rain two or three or four inches in a half an hour. So water management in the state of Florida is difficult because that great volume of water that hits the ground has got to be retained somewhere before it goes into the final receiving water body. And it, and it has to go through water quality treatment before that happens. Uh, wetlands can be a part of this. Um, the state historically has impacted a lot of wetlands and back under uh, George Bush Sr. Uh, there was a no wetland loss goal for the federal government and that the state has, the state of Florida, as far as I know, has adapted that. So what came out of that was the wetland mitigation program. So if you impacted a wetland, then you had to, and, and that was, and the water management district allowed that to happen, then you had to mitigate for it. And this mitigation over the years has taken a lot of different forms. You're used to, you know, they, used to want you to mitigate for everything on site if you could. Um, but when they did the future studies to see, how the, see what the success of that mitigation was, it didn't respond as well as if you uh, had done off-site mitigation in a large regional area. And eventually this less led to things like conservation banks, mitigation banks, et cetera, where large areas were, were permitted for restoration. Uh, these areas normally had quite a bit of man impacted wetland damage and which would make it easy to restore by plugging ditches and 
and restoring the hydrology as it was historically or as close to historically as possible. And so that's kind of where the mitigation has progressed in the state of Florida since 1972. So within ecology, as you know, there's this concept of hysteresis, right? This idea that ecosystems, right, don't get better, you know, after each disturbance, it gets consecutively worse as the baseline decreases. You know, a lot of people, when we're talking about, when when people discuss kind of habitat mitigation, right, a lot of people kind of point to that as a potential issue. Um, kind of That's a what? As a potential issue. So when a land developer does kind of come in, you know, and they give it to the land, you know, some people kind of view that as a little bit of a cop-out you know, kind of discuss that point a bit more. Do you believe that? I mean, is that accurate? Well, we need to face the fact that laws in the state of Florida allow development. Florida's government and income is based on having more people move to Florida. That's just a matter of fact. Um, So you have to figure out how to accommodate that and chapter 373 which is the water management authorization act um does that uh back in 72 it was in one form now in 2022 it's in a different form and as you learn as uh, as you learn from science then you have to change the laws to learn from that. And that's where BMAP processes came from, because the existing water quality requirements, water quality improvement requirements of existing regulations weren't meeting the required TMDLs, total management data, total managed, can't say that word. Uh, TMDLs, anyway, total, I can't, I can't do it. I'm sorry. I forgot. But that that is, I think, right? Yeah. Total maximum daily loads. Thank you very much. Of course. All right. That is the amount of nutrients that can be in the water basin in the, in the final discharge point, whether that's Indian river lagoon or the St. John's river or the Atlantic ocean, um, or on the other coast, the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, so, what was determined since the law came into effect in 1972 was they they weren't being met. So now we have uh, basin maps, B maps, that are a plan for all landowners to do water quality so that the, that eventually the water body will be better instead of worse. Okay, so uh, BMAPs however, have been criticized pretty harshly in the past because of exactly the same reason you just mentioned, right? This idea that, you know... Because of what? Because of the reason you just mentioned. This idea that, you know, the standard, you know, that was first kind of created wasn't enough, right? So, so essentially this cycle... So they were criticized for the reason you just mentioned because, um, because you know, the standards that were, that were set weren't enough. How do we go about avoiding that issue in the future? I mean, is that just a science issue? I mean, some people might point to different actors kind of promoting certain different levels. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Well, unless the Florida law changes to not allow people to move to Florida, which I don't think will ever happen, then the science world and the water managers are going to always be playing catch up. Mm. Um, the the science changes. I mean, once you decide to do something, uh, for instance, retain the first inch and a half of runoff from a particular project, what that does is it only gets about seventy percent of the pollutants. So every so every project that is permitted dumps an additional 30% of pollution toward the main water body. And it is hard to to adapt to that and make the water quality better. In the 30 years that I have been in business, 
surface water quality and groundwater quality in the state of Florida have gone down. And um, so BMAPs are an attempt to adapt to that and make it better. Uh, but every landowner in the basin, whether it's residential or agricultural, has got to put forth the best science-based and engineering-based technology to improve their water quality, or at least to not make it worse when it discharges off their site. And it's gonna take everybody. And, and as more and more development is allowed, that, that's gonna be more and more critical, because as far as I know, every development ha, you know, increases pollution in that water body by 30% of its uh, of its total pollutants. So you kind of just mentioned these different stakeholders that you kind of have to deal with. You know, discuss the difference between dealing with kind of these agricultural stakeholders as opposed to these land developers. Agriculture in Florida has always um, um, had a a very good position with the legislature in the state of Florida in the fact that, that there's lots of programs for agriculture. And it is, if we can't grow food or raise food, then we're going to end up eventually being come, becoming dependent on somebody else in the United States, other than the United States of giving us food. Um, so, that doesn't mean they should be given preference. Uh, that means that, as you heard in the springs, the, the senator, you know, wanted to pay uh, or help facilitate the farmer to adapt to the regulations, and and that's been, as in my view, the legislature's position. Um, but residentials, excuse me, residences, commercial development. And residences and agriculture all contribute to decreased water quality, so they all need to do their part. Yeah. So, you mentioned how agriculture provides a service. You know, food right directly impacts our economy. You know, in that regard, there's a independence. Developers, however, you know, that's kind of a different story. I mean, um, like I said, how did you deal with the land developers when you um? when you served as chairman, you know, did they kind of have a different, did they, you know, how was the culture dealing with them? Was it a little bit different compared to the way well, you with the farmers? There is a rule that governs, it's called the ERP rule, and it governs land development, whether it's agriculture or commercial or residential. And there is a rule for uh, consumptive use. And as a board member, you, what you needed to do was to make sure, which the staff that does for you, that the permit grant could be granted if it meets the rule. That doesn't mean that the project makes the environment worse. That doesn't mean it makes it better. That just means when they issue a permit and as a board member, you have to make sure the rules are written so that they're good. But when it comes to a project, you are bound by the fact of whether it meets the rule or does not meet the rule. If it meets the rule, you need to grant the permit. Or otherwise, some attorney is going to come back and sue and say, you, 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 there's no reason for you not to grant this permit. And on the other, so you, as a board member, you walk a fine line between environmental activists and developers and, and farmers, um, because if you go too far one way, one person is going to complain, go too far the other way, the other person is going to complain. And if they have a lot of financial support, they'll end up suing and you, and you really don't have any benefit to anybody to deny a project for no reason. So when dealing with these different stakeholders, 
how what was your personal philosophy with dealing with them? How did you go about kind of managing these different perspectives? Dealing with the stakeholders? Yeah. How did you go about kind of dealing with all these different perspectives? What was your personal philosophy? I am concerned that development and population increases in Florida are going so rapidly that we, uh, science is not going to be able to keep up and provide the protection that needs to be, that needs to happen. Um, but, but I have no control over who moves to Florida, who doesn't move to Florida and why. Um, one of the issues is that people who move to Florida who have no history here, um, Florida is such a better place or looks like such a better place than where they moved from that they don't really believe there's, they have a hard time believing and have to be convinced that there's issues that need to be corrected. And so politically, it's difficult to get the regulations uh, and the, the concepts nailed down so that the voting public understands what the problems are and they, they can be fixed and will vote for the regulations that can fix them. So it's, uh, I am, I don't mean to be a naysayer, but I'm not so sure that we're ever going to recover from that, at least not in my lifetime. As an example, the Indian River Lagoon drainage basin, which runs from uh, about Daytona Beach south all the way to West Palm Beach, their drainage basin has increased by 148%. There's no way that water body can take all that additional water and not degrade, which is why the major, the major reason that the lagoon is in trouble as it is now, because it is an impaired water body. Uh, it's just difficult to keep up with the population and all the development for agriculture, for homes, for commercial. It's just hard. And cities and counties have issues uh, trying to meet TMDLs because there's not enough land there. They can't go out and buy people's homes and tear down buildings to do retention ponds to, to improve the water quality. So there's an issue there. And we have to learn to fix our past mistakes. And the faster it develops, the more mistakes that are made we don't know about them and it takes us a while to figure it out. And then we've got more problems because we don't have enough land to do what we need to do. I was speaking to Jake Vaughn yesterday and he mentioned that, you know, when he was working for the water management districts, he, um, he, he sometimes he utilized a moratorium, right? Um, specifically within Orlando um, on development. Do you, um, what are your thoughts on that as a solution, at least in, in the short term? Moratoriums are very controversial. Mm. Uh, people get hurt financially with moratoriums. Uh, however, they do give you a breather to figure out what's going on. Um, and so that's not a bad idea. Uh, but it's politically a difficult thing to get done. Uh, the leaders who do that don't want to hurt themselves economically. And, and their concept of economic development is more people. So it's hard for them to make that decision. The scientists have their, have their make needs to make sure that their data is correct because uh, if a moratorium will allow a plan to be adapted so that it is more effective in, a, in improving water quality and quantity, then they're not a bad idea. But it's a very political, difficult, a difficult political thing to do. Interesting. And 
So I guess to kind of just um, switch the topic a little bit, you know, you kind of served on the water management districts roughly around um, the time that the Springs Initiative was passed under Jeb Bush. Kind of discuss how that affected um, kind of the, the way, discuss how that affected the water management, the way St. John's water management district was run. What did that change? Well, like I said, the water management district has to, has to adapt and enforce the rules that they're given by the legislature. Mm -hmm. And that's what they do. Um, I don't believe, I mean, I went to Stetson University and I was associated with Blue Springs since I went there. Mm -hmm. and, and I am not sure that scientists understood uh, a lot about spring sheds back in 1972. Uh, they do understand about them now. They do understand that that high sandy ridges uh, add water to the aquifer. And whether it's the surficial aquifer or whether it's the Florida aquifer where, or whatever aquifer is underneath the ground there. Um, and so anything you do to the soil uh, around the spring that drains to the spring affects the spring's water quality. And there is a lot of development around those springs. People like the springs. They like to live near the springs. Uh, and so there's, you know, uh, septic tanks that are an inexpensive way to take care of water quality. They were originally designed to take care of the bacteria that would cause people disease. Uh, what was missed was the additional nitrogen and phosphorus they put in the groundwater or surface water. Uh, uh, well, ground groundwater that goes to the surface water. They have adapted things now. There is a product called Bold and Gold, which is the generic name for a, a, a material that will absorb uh the, the nitrogen and phosphorus as it's discharged from a drain field. So we're learning to adapt to that. But you've got to, you've got the old septic tanks that are in that uh, lots of times those places are lower income, middle income families, and they don't have a lot of money to fix that kind of stuff. Uh, as far as they know, they got their existing septic tank under the existing rules. And now that the rules have changed, it, you know, they've got to comply, but the legislature has not shown a lot of interest in forcing that compliance. Um, so uh, it's a difficult, it's as everything, it's not just an easy fix. Science can figure out how to fix it, but there are other uh, circumstances that lead to make it more complicated. And it's not easy. And people will have to end up voting themselves more money to fix their septic tanks when they get replaced. And uh, if they don't do that, then the springs are continue to go great. And if farmers don't figure out how to provide uh, enough fertilizer for their plants, but not too much so that goes into the groundwater, then they're going to be contributing too. So um it's difficult because the existing regulations allow the pollution and new regulations uh are always not politically popular so in the case of, um you know you just mentioned subject things you know um some of the solutions that have kind of been proposed kind of mitigate kind of what you were just mentioning was having the state kind of um sir i think you're coming off sir Say that one more time. I think your camera is off. Okay, no, your camera was off for a second. Um, so, what do you what are your thoughts on the idea of the state maybe funding, you know, some of the subject take issue? Um, fun, um, well, the, the state funds a lot of agricultural stuff. Yeah. Um, the there when I was in office or serving on a water management district, um, there was a bill 
that was initiated called Senate Bill 444. Mm -hmm. uh, this bill uh, allowed the state of Florida to assist in funding um, through the water management districts, funding regional water supply and quality regional water quality projects. That bill required local governments to fund 60% of the project. And then the water management district could come up with the other 40. Uh, that, would, that worked really well. But toward the end of my term, which was in 2008, say 2005, six, seven, uh, the economy started to really go down. And the ad valorem taxes that 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 the local governments and the water management district to, could collect went down. And so therefore there was less money. The water management districts uh, under the Senate bill started to uh, uh, acquire enough funds through ad valorem to be able to, su to supply these regional water supply projects and regional water quality projects. But at the time, the cities and the local governments didn't have the money to come up with the 60%. So uh, while the in good intentions were there, it just didn't work out toward the end of my term. So, I, um, like I said, I understand that you kind of left the district in roughly 2008, but, uh, you know, I just want to hear your thoughts on this. Under Rick Scott and now under DeSantis, you know, the water management districts have lost considerable amount of power as a result of not getting as much money through the, you know, through, through the, the decrease or abolition of the ad valorem tax. How do you think that's caused them, how do you think that's changed their ability to respond to these issues more effectively? Unless the water management district has the institutional knowledge and the scientists available, they cannot do the job they need to do. Uh, under Rick Scott, um, the, uh, the funds were cut for the water management districts. Um, and the governing board members were requested by the governor to reduce the ad valorem taxes every year. Um, this directly affected the ability of the water management districts to appropriately respond to any crises within their district. Uh, what happened when the, the staff was required to reduce um, and when that happened, and most of that happened after I was out of, off the governing board, but it began as I was just getting off. Um, and so in order to meet the requirements of the financial requirements requested by the governor's office. Uh, the agency was required, actually decided to, re to remove the high, most highest paid people at the district because it saved them the most money uh, because they were paid. They mostly had a, lo a long-term history with the district and had been there a while and were doing a good job. And their, their salary that they were paid was higher than anybody else. So it was easy to uh, let them go and then hire somebody who had less experience and no institutional knowledge to do the same job. Uh, those folks, uh, you know, with no institutional knowledge really had to had a problem to try to make sure that they were effective in what they needed to do to meet the rules. So it was a devastating blow to the water management district that saved me personally $6 on my taxes a year. Wow. So I'm um, kind of going off that the, the, the collaboration between the water management districts and DEP 
and how that relationship has changed politically over time. All water management district governing board members are appointed by the governor and approved by the Senate. Mm -hmm. The secretary of the DEP is appointed by the governor and approved by the Senate. Back when I was on the board, the secretary of the DEP uh, would call us and ask us to do something. And if the, our science at the water management district didn't didn't coalesce, you know, didn't agree with what the DEP was requesting, then basically the governing board had the chutzpah to say, you know, I'm sorry, we're not going to do that. Under Rick Scott, there was a, there is a portion of the rule that says that all water management districts, uh, uh, that I don't remember the verbiage right off the top of my head, but the, the, the DEP had the right to regulate the water management districts. Hello. Are you there? Yes, sir. Yep. All right. So what ended up happening was the governing board, because they're appointed by the governor, the governor essentially told the governing board, you're going to follow what the DEP secretary says you should do. And so then there is a big push. And granted, there are five water management districts in the state of Florida, and all those water management districts were not consistent with one another. But... I don't think they needed to be consistent with one another because the environmental conditions and the, and the development responsibilities within each basin are different. But Ms. Scott thought that was important and the folks that supported Mr. Scott and told him that that was important, uh, that ended up happening and the secretary of the DEP essentially can tell the water management what to do. In that same time period, legislature uh, changed Florida state law. Districts cannot change a rule uh, unless it's consistent with all of Unless it's consistent with other water management districts. Um, and it has to pass the legislature. So, so you, you now go, you see a problem, you see, you see that the rule needs to be changed, you take it to the governing board, the governing board says the rule needs to be changed, and the legislature then has to vote on whether that rule can be changed or not. So the autonomy of the water management districts was greatly restricted. So... A lot of them, uh, you know, a major issue I've kind of been hearing the top end is that power is becoming more centralized, you know, within the state government. You know, um, autonomy from uh, the city level at the county level has kind of decreased quite substantially, and now it's all going towards the top. Why is that an issue, you know, in terms of work, um, in terms of water management? Well, I, it, it may not be a popular thought. But I believe that that term limits have caused this problem. Mm. Uh, essentially, with term limits, the people that have all the power at the state government uh, are the are the governor, the president of the Senate, and the Speaker of the House. There are no other uh, legislators that have enough tenure uh, to, to be able to, to stand up and go against what the governor or the, or the Speaker of the House or the President of the Senate says they should do. Um, and so because there's no long tenure there, and this, this tenure is true at local and, and county governments also, um, there's just nobody there 
when I was on the water management district, it took two or three or four years to figure out what you were really supposed to do because you come in not really knowing the rules and regulations as well as you should. And it takes a while of working with them before you understand what you're doing. Same is true with the legislature. Um, and so uh, what you have now with term limits, as an example, in some years, there's like over 200 people in the in St. John's River Water Management District's basin that the staff has to go educate about what the water management district does. And, you know, I don't know how, how without having somebody that's been there long term, how you can avoid uh, unfortunate decisions being made just because people don't really understand what's going on. Well, it's, it, you know, it's a really interesting conundrum because it's like, uh, like you said, for, this, for the reasons you just mentioned, there's a virtue in having someone that's there that isn't as, you know, accountable to, to the local winds. But at the same time, like, you know, there's a virtue on, on the other side of kind of having accountability and having elections and, you know, having the ability for kind of fresh blood to change. So, I mean, how do we deal with that issue? I mean, it's, uh, this doesn't really seem to be an easy answer. Well, most water management decisions have a 20-year time frame. Mm. All political decisions have an eight-year time frame. The governing boards of the water management districts are appointed by the governor. Mm. I don't ever believe, I believe, I never believe, no, let me rephrase that. I do not believe that any of the board members of the water management districts should be politically elected because water management need, districts need to do make decisions based on science. Um, it, term limits are an issue, uh, but I think that's a good idea to have appointed board members but they need to have the autonomy to make the best decisions for their basin. Taxing people uh, for their for water problems within a specific search surface water basin is a great idea. Taxing people on a statewide basis for their water quality issues are not a good idea because then the folks that have the most votes gets the most water and the best water quality. And that that it will interrupt the science that's showing us different. You know, I guess what I think they should, most people have is this idea that so people believe that the water management district board is kind of stacked with a bunch of developers and agriculturalists. There's not enough scientists or activists on the board. Um, you know, kind of discuss that issue a bit. Well, there, I, I do not remember all the, the, the professional positions that people need to be in to be appointed to the water management district, but there are those positions. There are listed there, agriculture, attorney, biologist, developer, on and on and on. Um, and it is an enormous issue for the governor because he has thousands of people to appoint, you know, as part of his duty. And, and he has to depend on his staff to select the, the best people. Um, if, if you want to influence the legislature, bring your wallet out and, you know, help an individual get elected. Uh, but when, when individuals do that, then politically they have an in uh, with the politicians because, you know, the politicians feel grateful that they have funded their election and helped them get elected. And so they are know those people better and are more inclined to point, appoint those people uh, to the board's that that are available where positions are available and but if you're going to do the right job you need to make sure there's the correct balance so the right decision is made do i know 
everything about everything and all my decisions are the best? No. No, you, I truly believe in the nine member board and every member has a vote. Um, and so when you have a disproportionate number of individuals, uh, you cannot come up with a group decision um, or it's very difficult to come up with a group decision that is correct if you don't have the right number of, of professions represented on the board. Interesting. Um, the Springs and the Aquifer Protection Act during the summer. Yes. Quite a bit of discussion about the verbiage, right? Um, you know, what, what are your thoughts on kind of the way it was worded, kind of, you know, the issues with that act or the. Well, I, I can say that the, the state of Florida has identified primary focus areas for the St. John's. Mm and for Southwest Florida and for Northwest Florida. And they also have uh, applied BMAPs. Um, the law about BMAPs is not bad because it provides um, additional protection. Uh, the problem that you have, at least I think the problem with the BMAP process is it has a five-year window. So, uh, you know, if you find a problem or, a, for instance, the Indian River Lagoon started showing really bad signs of water quality and we had to wait another three years in order to, to change the BMAP process to improve the water quality when we really should be able to die, have done it three years previously. So it's a problem with the law. Um, and that is your position as a board member to change things uh, if you can. But, but now uh, those things are what I consider politically led. And even though you've got the science that says you need to do X, Y, Z, I don't believe decisions are being made along those lines. Interesting. Yeah. So, um, so we discussed BMAPs at all, um, quite a bit. Um, how about, I'm sorry, BMPs, I think they're called, best management practices. Um, what, give me your thoughts on those. Agricultural has been told for years that if they follow best management practices, they won't have to do anything additional for their discharge. Mm. And the laws are written to facilitate that decision. Um, if there is a surface water basin or a spring shed or groundwater that is being polluted, and the source of that pollution is identified, then things need to happen to correct that. And if, and if, and if best management practices aren't adequate, because best management practices were set a while ago, if best management practices are finding, found to be inadequate, then they need to be changed. But the water management district can't do that without the legislature's approval. So describe that a bit more, right? So, um, so describe the process. So let's say I do. Want, let's say uh, we want to change a best management practice. Describe kind of the way that works. I don't know how it works. Okay. Yeah. No worries. I, I I am too far away removed from what the existing law says and who is responsible and that all. You know, I I, I just don't know. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, no problem. Um, and I guess kind of the last question I'll ask you um, is that, uh, you know, for anybody that's listening to any of our audience, kind of what do you, um, what final thoughts do you have? Any words of wisdom, that type of thing? I would love to be able to see the water management districts be able to make decisions strictly on what the science says should happen. Water 
decisions are 20 and 30 years long. Um, you know, you, if you're going to do a regional water supply project, you got to have the funding in place 10 years before you can do the project. So time is critical. Um, and I think we're back up to a thousand people a day moving to Florida. Yeah. And it just makes our, our critical water decisions more difficult to make because every time you put a house in an area where there shouldn't be a house, then it, then, or a building or a farm, uh, you know, that, then that's not good for water quality, but people have, I truly believe people have the right to build their home and have the right to have their business and start their business and run it like they, they want to run it. Um, but uh, your environmental impacts have to be considered. I mean, I, I like to say something that's maybe quotable. <laughs> the, even the blue bird of happiness doesn't crap in its own nest. And, and we have been doing that every year that I've been aware of things going on in the state of Florida. Mm -hmm. uh, there's got to be some hard decisions made um, and funds applied so that things will get better instead of worse. Absolutely. And I think that concludes the interview. I appreciate it.